My name is Jason Hasty, and I'm the athletic specialist for the Hargrit Rare Book and Manuscript Library. Uh, today is August the 8th, 2017, and we're once again here in the home of Coach Vince Dooley uh, for the fourth installment of our oral history series documenting uh, his life and career. So thank you again for inviting us in, Coach. We're certainly glad to be here and looking forward to what you have to say today. Well, as you uh, said, every time you've uh, come, it's rained, so I hope you'll keep coming because we sure need the rain out there in my garden. <laughs> well, it does keep your garden looking nice, and it yeah. is a beautiful garden. So, um, Today what we're going to talk about is your time as athletic director, uh, which encompassed some real successes or a couple of crises that you weathered, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, you were athletic director for 25 years from 1979 onwards. Uh, I want to kind of go back a little bit to when you were hired as, as head coach. Uh, Joel Eves was the athletic director, and of course you would see him functioning as athletic director for 15 years. What did you learn from Coach Eves about how to uh, function as athletic director? Well, I was very fortunate to have uh, someone like uh, Coach Eves, uh, who not only was an athletic director, but he was also a coach. He was a basketball, the head basketball coach at Auburn, and in fact, I played for him. Uh, and he also was a football coach. So he had a great appreciation uh, for, the, uh, for the challenges of a coach. And I think that um, it's one of the things that's maybe, I think, missing today is that very, very few athletic directors have ever coached. And I think uh, while it's not absolutely necessary uh, that they coach. I think it is a big asset, however, to them because they understand coaches. They understand their needs, and I think they can better serve uh, coaches by being a coach. And Coach Eves uh, was a basketball coach. He was also a football coach. And because of that, uh, I think we had a great relationship. Uh, and uh, not only because he was a coach, but because also that uh, we worked together. I played for him in basketball. Uh, we scouted together as football assistant football coaches. Uh, I knew him well. He knew me. Uh, and so I think it's extremely important that the athletic director and the football coach uh, be able to get along well. Uh, and that's not has not always been the case in a lot of uh, programs, but it was certainly the case at uh, Georgia with Coach Eves. Uh, yes, I uh, I learned a lot from him. He was extremely frugal. Uh, sometimes I thought to a fault, but uh, at that time there was an economic crisis in athletics at the University of Georgia, uh, and uh, things were really not going very well. Uh, both on the football field or in the total athletic program. Uh, there were certainly uh, uh, some challenges financially, and they had to adjust by uh, taking some of the coaches and making them part-time physical education instructors. So they got half of their money from, from the physical education department and half from the athletic department. Uh, the grounds crew, as an example, uh, what's totally uh, to under the grounds crew at the university and not under the grounds crew at the at the athletic association, uh, and all of that was necessary in order to make the budget every year. But fortunately, we we did well in football, uh, and uh, the uh, we had a great increase uh, in uh, interest in football, and uh, we, we were able to expand the stadium, and uh, because of that. Uh, uh, we financially got uh, solvent, so to speak, uh, and we were able to uh, pay our coaches uh, well, and we were able to uh, build facilities, uh, which was necessary in order to compete. Uh, and uh, Coach Eves uh, was a, a great mentor and a, uh, the one that really gave me the opportunity. And uh, above anything else, he was a man of integrity. Uh, and that was a solid base and, a, and one that, uh, that I agreed with uh, totally, and I think that it helped in our relationship that was so good. So you were, uh, Coach Eves retired and you took over as athletic director in 79. 
What ideas did you have about running the program at that point? Things that maybe uh, were continuing with, with programs put in place by Coach Eves or new ideas that you wanted to bring into the program? Well, at that particular time, it was, it was a little bit of a controversy. Uh, I really felt like uh, that uh, I, was gonna, I would be the best choice as an athletic director uh, because I had, first of all, a broad interest in athletics. Uh, I was certainly a football coach, a focused football coach, but I also had a great appreciation for all athletic programs and wanted a total program. Uh, and secondly, because I had been here at Georgia 17 years at the time, uh, I uh, had established myself and had good help in, a in football, and I also was able to get good help uh, in athletics and, and a person named Lee Haley uh, that we played together. Lee Haley had been an athletic director and he became the associate athletic director. So I had good personnel on both sides of the ball. And by being here 17 years, I was actually the assistant athletic director under Coach Eves. So I had a pretty good idea of the needs. I had a pretty good idea of the challenges that we were getting ready to face. And I was, I'm talking specifically about Title IX. Mm -hmm. I'm talking uh, uh, specifically about facilities. Uh, I'm talking about uh, facilities for women's sports under Title IX. And uh, because of that, I really thought uh, that I would be the best choice. But at the same time, there was beginning to be a mode that you did not want football coaches or coaches being athletic directors. And I understood that. In fact, I think it's a bad mistake if a coach comes in and takes on the job of both football coach and athletic director because that person needs to be totally focused on coaching football and not to be able to do try to do both of them. But because I'd been here 17 years, I felt like that I had gotten my football established and I could handle both jobs. Uh, the president, Dr. Davison, was very concerned about it because it was the, the new trend. You don't want to get a football coach to be athletic director. And I understood where he was coming from. But fortunately, and it was began to be a controversy, uh, but fortunately I came to him and, uh, and suggested a, a sort of a compromise. I, uh, Reed Parker, who was the, uh, at the, uh, uh, was the faculty chair of athletics mm -hmm. uh, and, and the forestry department as well, but he was very close and uh, Dr. Davison wanted him as the uh, athletic director. So I, I asked uh, Dr. Davison if he would consider having sort of dual athletic directors, that Reed Parker would be the athletic director for administration, which I think would give him the comfort that he needed. And I would be athletic director for sports uh, because I knew all the coaches and I knew what really was needed as, in sports. Uh, and that worked very well uh, for two years. And I think he was very pleased with that. And then uh, after the second year, uh, we did so well that I became the total athletic director, uh, administration, uh, as well as coaching. Uh, so uh, I thought it was the right thing to do and it proved to be good because uh, we had that great run in the 80s in all of our sports, particularly in basketball had a tremendous run under Coach Durham, uh, and we had a great run in, uh, in football. And then we were able to meet some other challenges in all the other sports that we had uh, by uh, really having a, a good broad program. Our women's sports, uh, we, we got on that early, and uh, we did because Liz Murphy, uh, there was this thing called Title IX, that nobody quite understood. They had an idea what it was, but they didn't know how it was going to be interpreted. And so everybody was waiting around. Uh, uh, what are you going to do? Uh, how do you interpret Title IX? Uh, and, and before that, I, I talked to Liz. I said, Liz, I don't know how it's going to be interpreted. You don't either. But one thing we do know, that, uh, that whatever 
sport, men's sport, that has a comparable women's sport, they ought to be the same. Whatever we provide for the men, it certainly should be provided for the woman. You've got a men's golf, women's golf, men's tennis, women's tennis. So that balance, and so the goal was to establish both in scholarships and in uh, facilities and recruiting budgets, whatever it is, the goal eventually was to balance all of them. And then we'll see. Now, well, by doing that, I think we got a tremendous jump on programs throughout the country. So our women's program immediately uh, got good support. And because of that support, uh, we were able to be way ahead of a lot of programs in the country. Uh, and that's still true today. Talking a little bit about Title IX, uh, how do you balance out women's and men's programs? How do you provide that total athletic program? Uh, is it simply a matter of making sure the money is even, or is there something on the administrative side that you had to do? Uh, did you have to convince your coaches that this was a good idea going forward? Well, I think that the first thing you do is hire good coaches, which we did. Uh, Andy Landers was still the first coach that I hired, uh, and Andy was only 28 years old at the time, so and he did an incredible job over a long period of time. So if you got good coaches, uh, then that's a great start. Of course, Jack Barley and, uh, and took on both the men and the women's and still one of the greatest coaches and ambassadors the university has ever had. Uh, and Jeff Wallace and the women's tennis, uh, we, we hired him and uh, he's won two national championships and he's still coaching, he's a tremendous coach. So we were able to hire, well others too, but uh, those were some of the ones that I mentioned. So we got good coaches and uh, I think that they, while they were working hard for their program to get uh, the very best, I think they also understood that that just doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and we had a plan, and maybe it was a three-year plan or a four-year plan of, about facilities and about salaries. We gradually increased the salaries up to where they uh, were comparable uh, in uh, most of those sports. So uh, with good coaches uh, and, uh, and with a belief that they uh, felt like that we wanted them to win. We wanted them to give them the resources that they need to win. Uh, and by doing that, I think we had a great working relationship. And what does that do for your overall program if you are really providing the resources? That is, does it simply make it easier to win? And how do you, as an administrator, oversee that? How do you make sure that everyone is getting what, they're, what they need and balancing things out so that no one program is getting more than the other? Well, you need to have uh, somebody that's directly over them. I mean, I can't be over all of them sure. uh, all the time. So I've, I had good administrative help. I mentioned uh, <coughs> Lee Haley, mm -hmm. who was my senior associate athletic director. Uh, and uh, he did a great, a great job. And he was followed by uh, John Schaefer, uh, who was a ticket man that had a good broad uh, perspective on athletics, all sports. Dick Beswick was another one. So I had good people in administration, and particularly that senior associate, like I just mentioned, those fellows there. And Liz Murphy was uh, done such a tremendous job with the uh, women's sports. So with good administrative assistance, and then they were able to uh, organize and have other people that would be responsible for uh, different sports. Um, I, I was talking about the, uh, the women coaches. I certainly don't want to leave out Suzanne Yachlin, who had an incredible run, uh, 10 national championships. But it's just another example of we were fortunate to really get good coaches. And when you get good coaches, you're going to have a good program. Uh, and we tried to provide them 
uh, what the, with what they needed. I think I think we had a good appreciation of a broad program, and I personally, if I'm going to be the athletic director, uh, I want to be the athletic director of a program that competes at the highest level. Sure. So. In most every decision that we made, that was always in the back of my mind. How can I help them to compete at the highest level? Well, with the advent of Title IX, you mentioned uh, facilities. Certainly, you would need to expand facilities or provide facilities for the women's programs. What were the challenges of providing those adequate facilities? Was it financial? Was it uh, convincing people that these were needed? How did you go about handling that and making room for the women's programs in the space that we had? Well, before. early on, um, the, the Butchmere building was built. This was the first real fundraiser that we ever had. It was a $12 million fundraiser, and that seems like kind of token money today when you're talking about 30 and 60 million. But 12 million was a lot of money. And uh, so this, uh, the Butchmere building, which would be a, we needed a good football facility. And in doing that, it, it opened up all of the office space in the Coliseum, which was occupied by coaches. The locker rooms were occupied by our football players. And by getting football out of the Coliseum in this Butchmere building, uh, which we needed to compete, uh, then it opened up the Coliseum to the other sports and basketball uh, and track uh, and, uh, and all the other sports, uh, when we first started out, uh, had office space and had locker space that before they never had. So that was sort of the beginning. Of course, since that time, we improved it considerably, but at least that's how we started and was able to provide them with the office space and the locker space that they, they needed in order to compete. Uh, one of the parts of Title IX is, uh, is, is that you need to provide equal scholarships for women and men. Uh, that necessitated adding programs for women and dropping a couple of programs for the men, for example, uh, our wrestling team. How were those decisions made? Was it purely economic, or were there other considerations as to how you added programs or got rid of uh, other programs? Well, we had to strike a balance in the uh, of, of of men and women's sports. Uh, and as I mentioned, sport for sport, uh, where it was comparable, I felt like we needed to be comparable. Mm -hmm. But Title IX was not interpreted that way. I was leaving football out of it to begin with, mm -hmm. but even in doing that, it, we got ahead of people. Uh, but nevertheless, it was based on scholarship, and football was, was part of it. You had to count football scholarships. Well, that's a lot of scholarships. So what they have done was raise scholarships in other sports. So you've got women's sports that in the case of basketball, in the case of uh, softball or whatever it is, there's uh, swimming, uh, there's more scholarships available for the women's sport than there is for the men's sport. Uh, and that's to make up for football. Uh, the other thing is, to, uh, uh, is the number of sports. So we had to add sports, which we didn't have. We didn't have track and field, which we had to add. Uh, and uh, our swimming program was, it needed to be expanded. Uh, we, uh, we added, uh, uh, we had men's gymnastics and women's gymnastics, but women's gymnastics was not getting uh, the lion's share. So what we had to do was to look at the number of sports on both sides, and we decided from an economic standpoint as well as a competitive standpoint that we would drop two sports. It was tough to do. Wrestling, as an example, is one that we dropped, and wrestling, as you looked at it, there were very few programs in the Southeast that uh, had wrestling programs. Auburn was one of them. But outside of that, uh, and then all your recruiting was not in the Southeast. Most of the great wrestlers were in other parts of the country. So it was logical, since we were not able to compete in the Southeast because there's only one or two other schools that had programs that 
unfortunately, wrestling was the, the, the choice. Uh, men's gymnastics as well, uh, which was another example of uh, a program that we didn't have uh, that many men's programs in, in the SEC, and you had to recruit in other places because it wasn't as popular as other sports. So we did drop those two sports as we added the other sports that we needed, which gave us the balance between the men and the women's sports that we had to have. Uh, as an example, uh, uh, we added women's soccer. Now I would like very much, I would have liked very much to have a men's soccer program, but we could not do it in order to be with Title IX. We did add uh, equestrian that gave us large numbers because numbers are important in evaluating if you're in compliance in Title IX. Uh, and it's been very, very good for us. Unfortunately, it's still an emerging sport. Uh, there's not enough programs that, uh, that have equestrian, but it's been a great thing uh, for us. And it gave us the numbers that we needed as far as scholarship balance is concerned. So those were some of the challenges that, uh, that we made and we kept uh, evaluating, having people come in and, and evaluate the program and see if we were in compliance or were headed toward compliance, which was the goal of uh, everything that we did. Uh, kind of moving away from Title IX a little bit, uh, not long after you took over as athletic director, there was a controversy that arose over our developmental studies program. Uh, professor in the English department, Jan Kemp, uh, alleged there were some abuses in that program. What was the purpose of the developmental studies program? Was it intended to help uh, athletes get, make the grades to go forward, or was it intended for all students? Maybe shed some light on what that program was, what it was intended to be. Well, the developmental program was George's answer to uh, uh, providing opportunities, uh, particularly minorities, uh, that uh, and and minorities and and other football players as well. Some of them did not have the basic uh, education out of high school, like in English or in math. Uh, it's sort of remedial courses. They needed those remedial courses in order to really get into the mainstream of the courses at the university, uh, which they didn't have in high school. They just didn't provide it. Uh, so it was primarily for those uh, in remedial type courses, like English, like math, uh, that would give them the foundation in order to move into the university and be able to compete and to be able to uh, get an education in those basic courses. So that was it primarily. Uh, and, um, and it was good. I mean, it, the, the, the philosophy was good. Um, there was some uh, uh, charges. We, it was called the Jan Kemp uh, uh, challenge, I guess, would be the one, because she felt like that uh, that some of these uh, uh, athletes were being uh, pushed on, and not just athletes, but they were also friends of other uh, people, maybe maybe politicians that had a child that needed to get in the university, so they went through the uh, developmental program, uh, and I think the administrative rule was that. If, uh, if they took a particular course and struggled in it, and it might have been English or math, that after the third time they didn't pass it, mm -hmm. then the, uh, the, the university had the prerogative to uh, exercise what was called an administrative exit. Uh, and so some of the players were administratively exited from that program to get into the mainstream. Uh, and uh, Jan Kemp was very concerned about that. She didn't like the idea of it. And uh, so she ended up filing a lawsuit. Uh, and uh, the uh, university, uh, as I look back on it, don't feel like that they handled it as well as they should have. Uh, 
But uh, for instance, I've got a, uh, I got about a 15 page letter from Jan Kemp listing all these things that she thought was wrong. Uh, so I called her up. I didn't know what she was talking about for the most part. And I said, uh, Jan, I can't uh, answer this uh, in, in a letter. Can I meet with you? Uh, which I did. I met with her the, with, at the Howard Johnson. Uh, we had coffee there. It lasted over two hours. And, uh, and so right away, half of what she was talking about had no basis at all. And uh, so I resolved that. And then the other half, uh, I told her I'd look into it. And then I did. And of the other half that she was complaining about, I found that 80% of that really was had no basis. But there were some things that needed to be corrected. Uh, and that was my concern. So we took the opportunity to make the program better because of these concerns. And I think because I met with her and, uh, and understood what she was talking about and made some corrections within the department based on some of her concerns that, uh, that I never, well, she never went after me, I guess you, you could put it that way. I mean, we had a pretty good relationship in that respect. And I think that uh, maybe at the university, did not, uh, 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 I think that they really stonewalled her uh, and uh, felt like that, uh, and it was, it was the feeling of the administration that if, uh, if we let this happen, then it would open up a precedent for all faculty members. Uh, and so they were determined to go to court when she sued. It, uh, she had tried to get an audience with some of the administrators, which again, I understand, they didn't want to meet with her. And, uh, and because of that, uh, uh, we had the lawsuit. And then when you have a lawsuit, uh, I don't think that uh, anything can happen in a court. I'm not sure that we had the best uh, lawyers, uh, but uh, Jan Kemp had a good lawyer. And uh, so it just so happened that, uh, that the way it went, that they ruled in, in favor of uh, Jan Kemp. So it was a, a real challenge for us. And so we got investigated. The athletic department got investigated by the NCAA. We got investigated by the Board of Regents. We got investigated by a faculty group. Uh, in other words, our whole athletic body was opened up when with a flashlight looked in every part of it. Uh, and, as I, and the great thing is that while you know, we had a black eye, uh, we were still on our feet. I mean, we had a sound program. If we had not had a sound program, we would have gone straight down. But the program was sound, and finally the newspapers came after us as well. Because uh, every day there was something new that, you know, made headlines. Uh, but most of it, there was nothing to it. Uh, but we took the attitude, look, every, we can't just answer everything that's being thrown at us. Let's take the opportunity to make the program better. So by having that attitude, instead of fighting everything, it, it helped and made our program better because we took that attitude. Uh, and the good news is that, uh, that the program was sound. Uh, the program was uh, based on one of honesty and integrity, or otherwise we would not have survived it. We really would not have survived it. And I think the attitude is, uh, uh, the attitude of taking it that we will make the program better as a result of it, I think helped us in that regard. Uh, case in point, we became the first school athletic program in the country to have a mission statement. It took us a year and a half. Uh, there were 25 uh, distinguished alumni that were uh, uh, interviewed. Uh, we had interviews within the department we had interviews outside of the department. 
faculty, alumni, and after a year and a half, uh, we came up with a mission statement of what we are all about. You know, why are we here? Why are we doing this? And, uh, and that ended up being uh, a mission statement, and, uh, which we still have today, and it was based on certain values, teamwork, uh, development of the individual, uh, uh, maximum uh, fulfillment of excellence in whatever you do, uh, and above anything else, integrity. That value is the top of it all. So, and we still have that in the department today. And that was because we took the attitude, we're gonna make the program better. And because of that, in our, in our evaluation, that's what we needed. And it's the first one in the country to have a mission statement program. Now, since that time, everybody in the country's got one. But it was an example of, of taking something that could be a crisis and turning it into an opportunity to be better. And we, and we were better as a result of it. Talking a little bit more about that, what other concrete steps did you take to make the program better? Um, was there uh, higher standards for athletes coming in? Were there uh, more oversight of what they were doing in the classroom? Uh, how did you continue to monitor that to make sure that something like this didn't happen? Well, we strengthened our academic uh, program, mm -hmm. we did. We did raise our standard uh, a little bit higher than the rest of the conference, and I think it hurt us a little bit for a couple of years. Uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, uh, I think we were just under the radar of, of, of recruiting for a couple of years. We were with, with, with a handicap because of it. Now, since that time, everybody else caught up to where our standards were, but for two years, our standards were higher than everybody else's, most everybody else in the league. Uh, and, uh, and that was one of the things that we did and adjusted, uh, though it did, I th I'd say, affect us a little bit. So just kind of a short-term setback for a long, make, to make the program better in the long well, term. Well, that's good. one way to put it, yeah. It was a short-term setback uh, for making the program better. And, and so in the long run, it was the thing to do, yes. One of the other kind of an, an interesting uh, I won't say controversy or, or difficulty, but an interesting situation. Um, we spoke last time about uh, having to replace Coach Goff. Uh, when you replace Coach Goff uh, at the end of the 95 season, uh, you looked for another head coach and you found a gentleman named uh, Glenn Mason, uh, who ultimately was hired but decided not to come to the UGA. What, what was the situation was that? What, if you can speak to that at all. Well, um, I did make the decision uh, to make a change, uh, mm -hmm. which was very difficult because uh, I recruited Ray Goff mm -hmm. and his family that I knew so well, and, uh, and Ray played for me. He was uh, uh, the player of the year in the SEC. And then I brought him back as a coach, and he coached for me. Uh, and then he was hired. Uh, which I went along with and he was hired even though I was not the athletic director at the time because I was thinking about doing something else. So I resigned both as a football coach and as the AD and uh, then the administration wanted to, uh, uh, to hire uh, Coach Goff. Uh, I had initially recommended Irk Russell mm -hmm. at Georgia Southern and uh, I don't think the administration pursued that as aggressively as I thought they should have. Uh, but nevertheless, the decision was to hire Ray because he, Ray was a Georgia boy and uh, he was well connected and he uh, was a terrific recruiter. Uh, and uh, so I, that suited me because uh, that uh, Coach Russell was not uh, they decided to move on and hire somebody else, not to hire him. Uh, so it was a very difficult decision, uh, first of all, to, uh, uh, to uh, let Ray go. And, uh, but I, I had to answer the question, if you're gonna sit in this seat as athletic director, are you able to be able to make that kind of decision? 
And I finally resolved myself that, yes, if I'm going to be the athletic director, I had to make a tough decision. This was a very difficult decision on me personally. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we made the change. And uh, Lynn Mason uh, was well thought of uh, as a coach. And uh, he had a terrific record in a lot of different places. And uh, I had uh, watched him over a period of time. And after the, uh, uh, the search, uh, I felt like uh, that uh, he, would, he would be a, a good coach at Georgia. He, didn't, he had a terrific background. Uh, what I did not know, and I have to take the uh, blame for it, is uh, that there was a, a, a domestic uh, situation that I was not aware of between he and his wife and his children. Uh, so we did uh, hire him, we had a press conference, and uh, then all of a sudden, uh, and, and at the press conference, his children came. Uh, so I thought everything was okay. But his wife, who had partial custody, was not gonna allow those children to come to Athens. So it put the pressure back on him, and uh, so he just couldn't come. Uh, and it, uh, it was, certainly was an embarrassing thing that happened that quick. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we and had this happened Dolly. over a, just a span of a few days, just to make that clear. It was just right over the span of a few days that this all happened. Well, it all happened, yes, yeah. because I, I had my second choice was Jim yeah. Donnan, and I right away uh, made the decision to, to contact him when, uh, when uh, Mason decided that he just couldn't leave his children. Uh, and uh, Jim Donnan, uh, I knew him. He had coached for my brother. And uh, Jim had uh, uh, been a terrific coach at Marshall, uh, and he's into the College Football Hall of Fame uh, for the division level, not at the university level, but at the division level uh, at Marshall. Won a national championship. Uh, so he had a good, fine background. He coached at Oklahoma, uh, and he did a terrific job here. He recruited extremely well. Uh, and uh, but there was a controversy that uh, I could see early on that he and and uh, Dr. Adams uh, did not see eye to eye, and mm -hmm. it wasn't going to work. Uh, it worked fine. He won. Uh, we went to four bowl games. He won all four bowl games that he went to, but we got beat by Georgia Tech a couple of times. So the decision was made. I was. Uh, I was hoping that uh, he could have one more year, which would give him an opportunity to leave, because I could see that that, uh, that Dr. Adams and Jim Donnan was not going to get along. Uh, but I didn't want to just fire him, uh, and so I recommended that he stay one more. Well, they recommended that he stay. I didn't recommend increasing his contract. But uh, nevertheless, uh, Dr. Adams made the decision, which he has the right to do, of course, uh, that uh, we'd make a change. So we did make that change, even though I'd recommend that he had another year, primarily so that he could leave gracefully. Uh, a lot of times they'll do that with presidents. They'll give them another year so they could leave gracefully, but you don't do that with coaches, I found out. Uh, nevertheless, uh, that was uh, that was a little bit of a crisis. But uh, then we hired uh, Mark Wick, mm -hmm. and Mark had a terrific run here, as you know, for 15 years, sure. uh, and a man of uh, that had a winning record of probably I think it was fourth in the country. And uh, he also was a person of uh, of great integrity. Uh, anybody that knew Mark was proud of the fact that he represented the university the way he did. Uh, but in this day and time, the expectations get higher and higher and higher, and uh, they decided to make a change. Uh, when sometimes when you have new people that come in, then it's easier to make those changes. And if somebody that hired somebody, you kind of go the extra mile with them. And I. 
would have certainly probably gone the extra mile with uh, uh, with Mark Rick because I know what type of person he was. On the other hand, uh, as I've said before, uh, that if I had been my, in that position of hiring somebody, that Kirby Smart would have been the person I would have hired. And I think he's going to do a great job for Georgia. Uh, so anyway, that was the uh, that was the crisis where we had two coaches in a uh, in a period of about a week sure. and a half. It didn't last very long between one coach to the next. We were not uh, we were not without a coach for uh, longer than two or three days. So you mentioned, and, and you know, again, I want to restate that uh, Coach John did have some great success here, recruited really well, went to pole games. Uh, but you mentioned that he didn't see eye to eye with Michael Adams. Could you shed some light on that? Uh, Was there a personality issue or just something? On the well, program? I think I think that's part of it as well. Um, there were there were some things uh, that were. Uh, not exactly the way they appeared uh, from a PR uh, standpoint, but uh, I think it was uh, uh, perhaps a personality difference. Let's put it that way sure. and leave it at that. How do you, as an administrator, but not only as a former coach, and you've, you've touched on this a little bit, how do you go about making, how do you go about overseeing your coaches? Do you continually put yourself in their position? Do you look at things from their perspective and yours? How do you work with them to get them what they need to succeed? And keeping in mind you have a wide variety of sports, men's and women's, large sports like football, smaller sports like tennis, uh, gymnastics, things that are successful, but how do you make sure that they are getting what they need in terms of facilities, in terms of money, well, if you hire good administrators, mm -hmm. then they are the ones that are with them all the time. As the athletic director, you can't be on the top of every coach. It is important that football succeeds because football funds 85% of the budget. 85% of the funding of of a, a budget now that's... Uh, at 125 million, 85 percent of that is generated through football. So football has got to be king of the hill, so to speak. You can call it whatever you want, <laughs> king of the hill or anything else, but it, it's got to go from an economic standpoint. So uh, I myself uh, handle the the coaching of that part of it. Mm -hmm. And all the other coaches had administrators, and they would come and uh, discuss with me their particular thing. Though it's not that we uh, had any closed doors to our coaches because uh, I met with our coaches, all of them, as a group, and individually they could come and talk to me at any point in time. So it wasn't that, that I had a layer uh, of administrators that the coaches couldn't come to me. They could come to me and also we had monthly meetings in which all the coaches participated. But the one that uh, I had to pay the closest attention to was the football coach and the men's basketball coach. I mean, the, the men's basketball coach uh, is also a revenue producer. And there's only two that are make net revenue and that's football and men's basketball. Now, gymnastics uh, uh, has produced revenue uh, of three, maybe $300,000 a year, but the budget is a million dollars. So there's $700,000 that's gotta, that's gotta come from somewhere else. Uh, baseball produces revenue, but it does not produce net revenue. So it's only football and men's basketball. So those two programs, all of them are important, but those two programs have got to succeed. Uh, looking at um, the current UGH coaches, there are still uh, several who are uh, here who you hired, uh, Jack Bowerly and Swim and Dive, 
uh, Manuel Diaz, who replaced uh, Dan McGill in tennis, Jeff Wallace in women's tennis, uh, Andy Landers, who recently retired uh, a couple of years ago. So certainly you brought in coaches who were here for the long term, but when you were going through a coaching search, what did you look for in a coach? Not only were they successful, but did you look for someone who reflected the way you would have coached, or did you just look for something different? How did you go about managing coaching searches for these different sports? Well, you can't always uh, be 100% uh, correct when you hire somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you certainly take uh, the history of winning, you can take uh, the individual uh, and how the individual has succeeded or is, or you are convinced that they have the equipment to succeed uh, and that, uh, that they're, they're, they're the right type of people. You'd like to get some people that would be here for the long haul. Uh, and so we were very fortunate that, uh, that those kind of things fell into place. And it was also uh, being able to make a decision uh, based on the confidence you have in the people that are making the recommendation. Uh, case in point, we had a study committee uh, for golf. And Georgia's had a great golf program for a long period of time. Well, on the committee, I had a couple of my administrators, and I also had a couple of, of former Georgia golfers that had been very successful in business and in other things. So I had my own administrators plus former Georgia golfers who were great golfers and have been very successful in business. Well, our coaches, wanted somebody else. But our golfers wanted Chris Hack. So I figure that our former golfers know a lot more about golfing than the administrators that I had. And so I took their recommendation instead of the, my own administrators. So it's a, a question of, of of analyzing it and then making a decision that you that you feel uh, in your heart is the right decision, and in, in this case, I felt like it was, and it has proven to be. Uh, Chris uh, Hack has uh, has just been an in, an incredible uh, coach in, in men's golf. Uh, the others were pretty pretty easy. Uh, Dan liked Manuel and. Uh, uh, and, and Manuel was great. The only requirement I had is they got a degree. Some of them didn't have it initially, but they got their degree. Uh, Beans Kelly was another one that uh, we hired that did a one. She was really good, uh, and she worked and got her degree. Manuel Diaz, who had gone on the pro circuit, uh, was short, so he got his degree. Chris Hack got a degree. Uh, that initially did not have a degree. That was my only requirement. I felt like those coaches that needed to go out and talk to student athletes about coming and being students and being athletes and working toward a degree, that they had to be a good example. Uh, so I required that they get a got a degree, and they all did. You mentioned uh, a minute ago you were kind of on the subject of uh, coaching searches. Your last major hire was Mark Richt for the football program. Uh, how did you go about finding finding him? Could, could you walk us through the process of, of the coaching search that took place? Was he just someone you knew about? Uh, how did you go about looking for a replacement for Jim Donnan? Well, we had... In such uh, a major, major yeah. uh, area. In, uh, it's, it's to the point in this day and time which was not the case at one time, is that you have uh, search firms. Mm -hmm. uh, I really was one of the last that got a search firm. Uh, for instance, we uh, hired Tubby Smith, mm -hmm. and my search firm was Dick Beswick. Dick Beswick, who was retired, 
uh, and he was able to make the contacts with, with Tubby. We knew about Tubby, there wasn't any question we wanted to hire him, but uh, Dick Beswick was the one that was, quote, our search committee. Only paid him a couple of thousand dollars. Today they pay him fifty, sixty thousand dollars for somebody <laughs> to do a search. Uh, I always say it. Sometimes you pay that, you pay that kind of money to hire somebody that uh, that could have gone ten yards down the road to get him. Now, in the case of the football coach Chuck Ninus, uh, Chuck Ninus, who I have known for a long time. He was the commissioner of the Big Eight. Mm -hmm. He then was uh, head of the uh, uh, College Football Association. Uh, and uh, I had had a long time relationship with him. So he started doing search on the side, just uh, not his main job. Uh, and he's the one that did the search for Mark and arranged for me to meet with Mark and then after I made the recommendation to, uh, to the president, Dr. Adams, uh, for us to meet with him. Uh, so uh, Mark had a, uh, had a great history. As an assistant coach, he was an integral part of, without a doubt, the best program in the 90s at Florida State. And he was a question of a person of unquestioned integrity. Uh, so it was really a kind of an easy hire to me. Uh, and he knew this area from a recruiting standpoint. The one question is, you're hiring an assistant coach, uh, maybe without a proven record of being a head coach. So from that standpoint, you could say it was a gamble. But I thought it was about as high a percentage of a gamble that you could possibly have. Uh, and he proved to be a, a terrific coach with a uh, won two championships early on. He had a championship by the second year uh, and uh, winning percentage among the top four or five in the country. Uh, and uh, so he was, he was an easy hire really in my, in my estimation. And we've talked about, we've mentioned, okay. uh, we're kind of down to about the last 10 minutes of this interview. So I want to touch on something um, that certainly was very public, and that was the end of your time as athletic director. Um, you've written about this, you've spoken about this, but what else would you like to add about the end, the end of your tenure as athletic director and the controversy that surrounded that with you mm -hmm. and Dr. Adams? Well, I wanted to uh, I wanted to stay on because we had just started a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, We had an we had an agreement uh, that uh, that I would serve two more years as AD, and after about a year of that, and since we just started into a fundraiser, I really felt like I wanted to see that fundraiser finished. So I went to uh, Dr. Adams to uh, uh, tell him that I would like to stay on, uh, and. Uh, and add uh, until we got finished with the fundraiser. Uh, and he took it under consideration, but in the final analysis decided he was gonna stay with the initial contract. Uh, I had even, it got to be controversial and I even recommended that if you'll just give me another year because uh, I could see that there was a split in the uh, Georgia people, uh, but he decided to stay with the original contract, which he has every right to do as the president. So I didn't agree with the decision, but it was his decision. Uh, and uh, and it, did, it did stir a, a controversy, there's no question about that. What else would you like to add about your time as athletic director? It's a subject so large and you had so many successes during your time. Mm -hmm. When you look back on your time, what are the things that really stand out to you that you accomplished that are most meaningful to you or else that you think were the best for the university? Mm -hmm. Well, we had, uh, I was athletic director for 25 years mm -hmm. 
And uh, during that period of time, um, uh, we had, I thought, a very good all sports program. Uh, there were three times that uh, uh, our program was finished in the top five in the country. One time we won four national championships and we finished second because you're going to finish second at Stanford because they got so many sports and they're all good that they've won the all sports trophy every year sure. except one and that's been out of 30. So, uh, so being number two, being number three and being number five and we, uh, so the program all sports was good. Our women's sports was very, very good. Uh, in in uh, in jumping on and getting ahead of a lot of people uh, early for some decisions that we made early about the facilities and about providing uh, opportunities for women coaches uh, that I think still resonates today. Uh, I'm very proud of that. From an individual standpoint, I was uh, president of the National Association of Athletic Directors. In fact, I'm the only person that I'm proud of that I was president of the American Football Coaches Association and also president of the National Association of Athletic Directors. And there's nobody else has ever been president of both of those uh, organizations. Uh, the fact that I was here as the athletic director for 25 years and that uh, now the record of our teams, uh, we had some bouts with the NCAA, but we never had uh, what was deemed, uh, uh, particularly in football, uh, serious. And by serious, I mean we we never had uh, any uh, penalties of uh, of not going to a bowl, which usually uh, it designates whether it's really major or whether it's a group of of of, of uh, not major uh, violations. In other words, one of the, the one of the things that you have to always be careful about is that uh, you're not accused of having a program that uh, that, that is out of control. Uh, you, you're going to have some violations we've had. Uh, so from that standpoint, uh, it's it's been good. Otherwise, I would have wouldn't have been around as long as I was around. Uh, and I think um, it. Uh, I think that there was uh, a feeling that uh, we had a great appreciation that this is an educational institution, uh, and that I respected that, and that that was first and foremost. Uh, the emphasis, uh, and uh, and so, and maybe that's why I stayed in college coaching because I enjoyed very much being around a university mm. uh, and taking advantage of the opportunities far beyond football uh, to be able to uh, uh, to audit courses uh, in in other disciplines that I have an interest in. Uh, which has really uh, been a big help to me and during retirement uh, with writing books. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoy history. We just finished a book on the Civil War that uh, about a local uh, hero, so to speak, in my mind, uh, who was a uh, faculty member. He was a first honor graduate. He was so good they brought him back as a, as a faculty member. He taught foreign languages and uh, then became a colonel in Cobb's Legion. But I've written a book on the history of the university. I've written a book on gardening. Mm -hmm. I've written a book on two or three books on football. Um, so uh, all of that has served me well as an individual after retirement or during retirement, after football, after mm -hmm. being at a place as long as I've been. I was here 40 years. Uh, and uh, very proud of that. We still had the same address, <laughs> 755 Millage Circle, from the time, well, six months after we got here. It's a and, very uh, famous address in Athens. <laughs> all of our children went to school here. So 
we uh, and we love love the University of Georgia. Well, as we kind of wrap things up today, I want to mention that um, first off, you did some of your research for your book in uh, in the Harger Library, and we were always happy when you came in to do your research. There was always a buzz through the office when you came in. Uh, but also, our next interview will be actually going into more depth into some of the things you're doing. Uh, outside of football, some of your academic endeavors, the books, your garden, certainly. So we're really looking forward to hearing more about what you do outside of sports because you do have a rich life outside of sports. So uh, for today, thank you for again for letting us come in and talk uh, talk about your time as athletic director, Coach. Well, it uh, was, was challenging uh, uh, being an athletic director, being a football coach, and being both at the same mm-hmm. time. Uh, but uh, while... Certainly, if I had the opportunity uh, to do it over, I could have done it better, but I thought we did it pretty daggone good. I wouldn't have stayed around as long, and it was well uh, well thought of. Uh, and I'm looking forward to life after athletics and talking about it and, and the things that I in, have enjoyed in, in my retirement, which has been very rich. Thank you. And I think next time we're going to get a view of your garden. So Yeah, we'll do that. All right. Thank you, Coach. Thank you.